Bhagavate Vasudevaya celebrating the evening RT. Um, forceful, enthusiastic kirtan of the holy name of the Lord. So I thought that this evening I would read to you some references from Shastra and perhaps say a few words also about the glories of the Lord's holy name. I hope you will uh, listen attentively and that by hearing the uh, many references from scripture about chanting Hare Krishna, it will inspire you to also take part in Kirtan. First there is a reference that chanting the holy name of the Lord is eternal and the highest dharma for all souls. It states in the Bhagavatam, the sixth canto, it is recognized that the highest religious principle in human society is devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Beginning with the chanting of the holy name of the Lord, Namasankirtana. This is described here uh, Paradharma. Paradharma means the supreme or topmost uh, of all religious duties. There are so many religious duties which we have according to our particular station in life. Uh, and these may be called Manadharma. But Sanatana Dharma means that which is eternally described for all living beings to follow and irrespective of whatever their present situation in life may be. And amongst or within the field of this supreme occupation, which is devotional service, the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is most prominent. Devotional service to Lord Krishna uh, is not one amongst many of religious activities just as Krishna is not one amongst many deities. He is considered the Param Ishvara. Ishvara Parama Krishna Sachit Ananda Vigraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarka Karana Karnam. Krishna is called Param Ishvara and also Anadir Adir. He has no beginning and yet he is the beginning of everything else. He is also Sarka Karana Karanam the cause of all causes. So there are many worshipable deities, but amongst them Krishna is considered to be most highly worshipable because of his qualification as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And in the worship of Krishna, uh, which is known as Bhakti Yoga, this term Bhakti is not really applicable to other deities because in terms of worshipping other deities we do it for a particular result. However, in the worship of Krishna it is described that anyavidashita sunya jnana karmadi anabrita anu kulyena krishnanu shilanam bhakti uttama Real bhakti to Krishna is without any motive without any selfish motive. It is primarily and only for the pleasure of the Lord. When you worship a god, a demigod, for example, even the highest of all of the demigods, it is for some material boon. Uh, and it is mentioned in the Gita that the demigods may bestow such boons, but their results are temporary and limited. Whereas only Krishna can give liberation. 
Therefore, he is not his, uh, another of his names is Mukunda, or one who grants liberation. So, in the process of devotional service, it begins with Shravanam Kirtanam, hearing and chanting. So this Sankirtan, the glorification of the Lord's holy name, involves Shravanam Kirtanam. There's another statement. This is from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. The holy name of Krishna is transcendental wish-fulfilling gem. It bestows all spiritual benedictions, for it is Krishna himself. It is the personification of divine mellow. So first of all, the holy name of Krishna and Krishna are non-different. In this day and age, people ask, do you believe in God? And the next question is, well, if you do, have you ever seen him? Why do you believe in what you cannot see? Why do you believe in what you cannot touch or hold on to? But here we find that this is a very simple way of being able to reach Krishna. That Krishna and his name are not different. So you can hear the name of Krishna. And hearing the name of Krishna is coming into contact with Krishna. Just like if you love someone and you hear their voice, you immediately feel their presence to be near to you. In the name of Krishna, not only are we hearing a voice, but we're hearing Krishna himself. He has invested within himself all of his transcendental qualities. This is explained. Krishna's name is the personification of divine mellow, the fountainhead of all pleasure. The holy name of Krishna is eternally liberated and spiritual. This is because the name of Krishna and Krishna himself are non-different. So we also hear that the name of Krishna is the source of all transcendental pleasure. Transcendental pleasure means pleasure which does not end with, the, uh, with any type of material condition. Generally the pleasure we find in this world is short-lived. If you, just like supposing you go and buy an ice cream, as soon as you finish eating the ice cream, the pleasure is over. Supposing you see a nice movie, once the movie is over, you have to turn to something else. Practically anything you can find in this material world, which is pleasurable, has a limit in terms of time. But it mentions here that the pleasure derived from the holy name is a type of ever-increasing pleasure. And the proof of it is that you can repeatedly chant the Holy Name without becoming tired of it. How long can you go on eating ice cream? How many times can you watch a movie again and again? No matter how pleasurable something may be in this world, it has its satiation point. Not so the Holy Name of Krishna. So it is possessed of very special powers. And therefore it is mentioned here it is a transcendental wish fulfilling gem. It has such special qualities, it can fulfill your spiritual desires. Not only that, it has even a better benefit. Because the holy name of Krishna is so discriminating that when you chant Krishna's holy name, not only does it fulfill your spiritual desires, at the same time it removes your material desires. Normally, uh, just like a touchstone, like Sanatana Goswami had a touchstone, Sparsha money. So, whatever he would touch would turn to gold. Iron, it had to be iron, but it would turn to gold. So you may say, well, that's certainly very good. What could be better than to turn everything into gold? But the problem is that with gold, you can buy anything. You can buy things which are very good, but you can also buy things which will be harmful. I mean, people who have a lot of money, like if you give someone who's a drunkard some money, as soon as he gets that money, he goes to a liquor shop. So there's no discrimination for a sparsha money in terms of what it produces. Gold can do anything for you. But the holy name of the Lord is different. The holy name of the Lord acts in two ways. It fulfills spiritual desire and it reduces material desires. 
Why? Because of Krishna. And Krishna is our ever well-wishing friend. A friend will never do anything which would be harmful to you. So Krishna acts in the form of his holy name as your very best friend. And as soon as you begin to take shelter of Krishna in the form of his holy name, he reduces your material desires. That's why sometimes people don't like to chant Hare Krishna too much. They're afraid. They say, if I chant too much Hare Krishna, then I'll become like all of you. That's it. So better that you chant for me. You pray for me. And when I get to be an old person, and I have no longer any ability to do anything, then I will chant Hare Krishna. <clears throat> then there's another statement. This is from the Hari Babsa. This is from Hari Vamsa. It says, Throughout the Vedas, the Ramayana, the Puranas, and the Mahabharat, from beginning to end, only the glories of the Supreme Lord Hari are sung. This is a astonishing statement because we know that in the Vedas there are many subject matters. In the Bhagavad Gita it is stated, Trigunya Vishaya Veda, Nis Trigunya Bhavarjuna that you have to rise above the uh, gunas, the three modes of nature which are describing different Vedic literatures. Hmm? The Vedic literatures are bounded, just like Puranas. There are 18 Puranas. Six are in the mode of ignorance, six are in the mode of passion, six are in the mode of goodness. And Bhagavad Gita clearly says, get beyond these three modes of material nature. Rise above the karma kanda, the fruit of parts of the Vedas. Rise above the jnana kanda, those parts of the Vedas that are describing impersonal liberation. And yet here in this statement of Hari Vamsa it says actually there's only one subject in all the Vedas. And that is the glories of the Supreme Lord Hari. But why is it saying that? Because everything in the Vedas is ultimately meant to bring you to that highest point. And therefore it is said that Vedasya Sarver Aham Eva Vedyo Vedanta Krit Veda Vida Eva Chaham Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that I am the final goal of Vedic study. Just like there may be many things taught in education, supposing in a particular subject, but the final degree is PhD. In one sense you can say that every single thing you learn in that subject from the very first day when you're a small child until that final moment of graduation when you get your award as a PhD is leading to the PhD. In the same way, if we trace out all the way to the final goal, we will find that that final goal is to take shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. And therefore it is said that all the Vedas, whether they be of any type, Mahabharat, Ramayan, the original Upanishads, four Vedas, their ultimate goal is the pleasure of Lord Hari, glorifying the Lord. This is Kirtan. Then there's some statements about chanting in the Kali Yuga from the Srimad Bhagavatam, 12th canto. 12th canto is the last canto of the Bhagavatam. It's written to as a send-off. means to give you some idea of what's coming up in this age. My dear king, who is that king? Maharaj Parikshit, the hearer of the Srimad Bhagavatam. My dear king, although the Kali Yuga is an ocean of faults, there is still one good quality about this age. Simply by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, one can become free from material bondage and be promoted to the transcendental kingdom. Again it is said, what was attained in the Satya Yuga? Through meditation. In the Treta Yuga? Through sacrifice. And in the Dwarpa Yuga? Through deity worship. Is realized in the Kali Yuga? Through Hari Kirtan. In other words, in each age, there are four ages. The golden age is Satyuk, and people are said to have lived up to 100,000 years. 
But now you may say, well, that's wonderful. Then you really have it, you know, you had so much time to do so many things. Not so. Because you had to do much more in terms of meditation. It is said that Valmiki Muni meditated 60,000 years to achieve perfection. So even though they have 100,000 years of life, they have to work very hard and they perform yoga meditation. In the Treta Yug, the system was through opulent sacrifices. And in the Dwarpa Yug, through big temples. But what is the method of worship in this age of Kali? Hari Kirtan, chanting the holy name. It's practical. Because here we are gathered today, but it's only one day a week that we gather together, so many people. Only a few of us can come every day. Most people cannot come to the temple every day. But as far as Hari Kirtan is concerned, very practical, can you go to a forest and do yoga? Not likely, it's dangerous. Even to go to a city park these days is very dangerous. What to speak of going to some distant forest? Do you think that you can do a big yajna? Then you have to invite some priest. You see, and they are already booked by so many other people. It's very hard to get a qualified priest to do a yajna. And even then we see that after the yajnas, still people have so many habits which are difficult to give up. Very impractical. And what about the yajnas which we read about in the Vedas? When they used to do the yagnas, Vishnu himself used to come down at the end of the yagna. Now, you may have seen some yagnas performed. Did you see Vishnu coming? They, Vishnu used to appear at the scene of the yagna and accept the sacrifice. We read about this in the Srimad Bhagavatam. You can say, I think Vishnu came, but I wasn't qualified to see. But Vishnu would come where everyone would see. Because in that age, that's how he came. Now in the Dwarpa youth, everyone used to go daily to the temple. In India today, and why in India, even in America, they still, or at least in some countries, they built the temples in, or churches in a central location so that people could go every day and worship. I've seen in, some, in many cities in India where people would go every day to the temple before going to work. Similarly, I've seen in the Philippines, people would go every morning to Mass before going to work. Not everyone, but a few people. So it's not so unheard of. But nowadays, most people cannot go every day to a temple. So you can see that we really cannot follow the methods of worship for Sati Yuk or Treta Yuk or Dwarpa Yuk. We need a special type of worship for Kali Yuk. And what is that? Hari Kirtan. You can do Hari Kirtan in your own living room. You can do Hari Kirtan going to work in your car or on your bicycle or walking. You can do Hari Kirtan while you're cooking. You can do Hari Kirtan while you're taking a shower. You can do it under any circumstance. That will be explained. That there are no hard and fast rules for chanting the holy names of the Lord. So it's so practical. Now it mentions how Kirtan of the Holy Name is the best of all. The remembrance of Vishnu certainly cuts sins to pieces. But it is very difficult to attain perfection through remembering Vishnu. Here the point is being made, smaranam. Smaranam or remembrance is very powerful. To remember Vishnu cuts sin to all pieces. However, it is very difficult to achieve perfection through remembering Vishnu. Only after great effort is such remembrance possible. It is very difficult to remember. Just like we see, that under all circumstances we find it difficult to remember the Lord. We may be in many different situations. And our mind can't be fixed very easily. So it says here, it's very difficult to constantly keep remembering the Lord. Just like Prahlad Maharaj, he's said to have achieved perfection through remembrance. He was able to remember the Lord 
under the most difficult situations. But we find it very difficult to remember Krishna. It's not easy. Even when you chant, sometimes your mind wanders. But so just remembering without kirtan is difficult. However, simply by moving the lips, there is the kirtan of the holy name, of Vishnu. And therefore, kirtan is the topmost topmost process of devotional service. Now meditation is mentioned. All glories, all glories to the all-blissful holy name of Sri Krishna, which causes the devotee to give up all conventional religious duties, meditation and worship. When somehow or other, uttered even once by a living entity, the holy name awards him liberation, mukti. The holy name of Krishna is the highest nectar in my life and my only treasure. Everyone wants mukti or in English some people say salvation. But here it mentions that one time chanting purely the holy name of the Lord that easily one will get liberation. And even better one can get love for the Lord. Love for the Lord is considered higher than liberation. The holy name is not regulated by time, place and circumstance. This I was mentioning before. O King, there are no rules governing the time and place wherein the holy name of Vishnu can be chanted. Of this there can be no doubt. Charity and sacrifice are governed by various rules regarding time and place, as are the taking of one's bath and the silent uttering of different mantras. But the holy name of Vishnu can be chanted in Sankirtan at any time, in any place on earth. When you do sacrifices, you have to take your bath, you have to put on completely clean clothing, you have to perform various uh, purification ceremonies, there has to be a qualified priest. So many things have to be right. Even chanting mantras like Gayatri Mantra. You have to face in a certain direction, you have to touch water, you have to be purified. But the chanting of the holy name of the Lord can be done under any circumstance. It is said that even a very sinful person once, when he got uh, hit by a wild boar and he was dying, he chanted the name of Ram. And he wasn't even saying the name of Ram. He was saying, Ha Ram, Ha Ram. Oh, and he was just chanting like this, that, Oh, how horrible is my situation. And just by saying, indirectly, the name of Ram, he got liberated. So the chanting of the name is so powerful. Ajamil was singing the name or saying the name of his son. Ajamil's son's name was Narayan. He was saying Narayan, Narayan. And he was only calling to his son, not even to God. But as soon as he called to his son Narayan, all the sins that he had committed throughout his life were washed away. So even if you don't think of the Lord, but you just say the name of the Lord, it is so powerful. It can purify you of all sinful reactions. And anyone can do it. Even a great sinful person can chant the holy names of the Lord and still it will have effect. What to speak of someone who does it with great devotion and love. Here, there's a statement to a hunter O oh, hunter, there are no restrictions on when or where the holy name of Sri Hari may be chanted and no prohibitions regarding the uncleanness of the mouth from which the holy name comes forth. In other words, this is ideal for this age. Sometimes when we tell people to chant Hare Krishna, they say, I don't feel pure enough to chant. But here we find that the holy name of the Lord makes you pure. You don't have to worry Am I pure? You will become pure by chanting. Then there's, an, then there's a mention of a Jamil. It should be understood 
that one is easily relieved from all sinful reactions by chanting the holy name of the Lord and chanting of his qualities and activities. This is the only process recommended for relief from sinful reactions. A very good question was asked. Maharaj Pariksit asked Sukadev Goswami that I see that very often people do atonement, prayas chitta. They commit some sinful action and then they try to counteract it with what is called prayas chitta. Just like in Christianity, people confess their sins and the priest will give them some type of uh, yeah, atonement to perform to counteract the sins. Maharaj Pariksit said, I notice that when people do this type of atonement for their sins, they still go on sinning in the future. So is there really any value to such atonement? This is the question he asked. Then Sukadev Goswami gave the answer that actually the chanting of the holy name of the Lord has a completely different effect. It is not ordinary atonement. Because whereas ordinary atonement may only neutralize the effect of the sin, the chanting of the holy names of the Lord uproots the original desire to sin. We see, for example, prisoners. People know that a criminal knows that if I commit a criminal act, I may be sent to jail. And sometimes they're caught and sent to jail. Still we see that they go on committing the same criminal behavior in the future and they land up in jail again. So what, what effect does jail have if it doesn't purify the individual? Sugadev Goswami says the chanting of the holy name of the Lord is not like an ordinary type of atonement. It has the effect of going so deep into the heart that the chanting pulls out from the root the very desire to commit sinful activity. So it is not to be compared with any other atonement. It is so uh, auspicious. <coughs> then there are some statements, the Bhagavatam, from the Bhagavatam on the volume of Kirtan. Just like there are three types of chanting. First of all, there is japa. Japa means soft chanting for one's own individual benefit. Then there is kirtan. Kirtan means chanting with a group of persons. And then there is sankirtan, which is very loud kirtan. So each one of them has their benefit. And now scripture states about each of these. Narada Muni is speaking. He says, I loudly chanted the holy name of Krishna in Kirtan, not caring for any social formalities. What does that mean, social formalities? It means that when you chant loudly, people standing next to you look at you as if you're crazy. He said, I didn't care about what people thought. Such chanting and remembering of the holy name benedicts everyone. In this way, I traveled across the earth, fully satisfied, humble, and non-envious. Compared to that person, and here's another statement from, Narada, from Sri Naradiya Purana. Compared to that person who is attached to chanting Japa, the person who performs loud chanting of the holy name of Sri Hari is 100 times better. This is because the person who chants Japa purifies himself, whereas the person who chants the holy name loudly in Kirtan purifies himself, all those who are with him, and everyone else who hears the holy vibration. And also those who are in the business of supplying hearing aids. They're also benefited. Loud kirtan benefits the chanter. Here it mentions in the Chaitanya Bhagavat, the animals, birds, and insects cannot chant the holy name. But by hearing the holy name chanted, they can benefit. Chanting the japa of the holy name of Krishna purifies oneself. But the loud sankirtan of the holy name of Krishna benefits all living beings. 
Therefore, loudly chant the holy name of Krishna and Kirtan, and you will get 100 times the benefit of chanting Japa. This is the verdict of all Shastras. Then a statement from Chaitanastakam. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu loudly chants the Hare Krishna mantra, which dances upon his tongue. As his radiant lotus hand counts the name by fingering the beads on the beautiful knotted counting string tied to his waist. His beautiful lotus eyes stretch to his ears and his arms stretch to his knees. When will Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu again appear before my eyes? So these are the many glories of chanting. There are so many other statements which are also telling of the advantages. So now our arti ceremony is going to begin and therefore we are all going to be able to have an opportunity to chant the holy names of the Lord very, very loudly and sweetly. Si si Radha Kalachanji ki, si si Radha Govinda ki, si si Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Devi ki, si si Gornitai ki, si Harinam Sankirtana ki, Go Premanandi Hari Hari Ro.